Johnson Helms, Return of Fire Mountain. Now, here's Channel 2 newsman Richard Ross. Good evening. Scientists from around the world are watching Mount St. Helens convinced that molten lava is moving inside the mountain and may indeed erupt. The latest in a series of surface level earthquakes shook the mountain early today. These earthquakes are different from the ones recorded last week and indicate that molten lava is on its way up inside the mountain. Today, Mount St. Helens sent a new plume of ash and steam three miles into the air. That eruption this afternoon lasted about 10 minutes. Ironically, a new storm system brought a fresh layer of white snow to the ash-polluted mountain about the same time as this latest eruption. Scientists are not in agreement on exactly where the biggest pocket of molten lava is located, but the best estimates place it about two and a half miles below sea level under the mountain. In some ways, the Mount St. Helens volcano has been erupting for months, it seems, but it was actually just a week ago today that the first steam was seen rising from that mountain. Our reporter, Bill Van Amberg, who's been covering the volcano nearly every day since that time, has a background report. Mount St. Helens, a volcano literally in our own backyard, a primeval site rising along the northwest skyline. As geologic time goes, a new mountain, a moving mountain, a constantly changing mountain. Most of the volcanic activity on St. Helens has happened in the last 2,000 years. The way it looks now was formed less than 500 years ago, and some of the major formations came to be just a little over 100 years past. It's a one-of-a-kind living laboratory of awesome earth forces. Looking at it, spending time around it, is a humbling venture. The mountain's power is staggering beyond comprehension. It can create its own weather, change the face of the country, sat around it, rattled the earth. One week ago, when the mountain started to erupt, none of us really knew what to expect. This was all we were seeing above the clouds, but dark as it was Thursday night, this is what we heard up on St. Helens when it started to erupt. Last Friday morning, these were the first views we had. Views not of St. Helens the mountain, but views of St. Helens the volcano. Its rounded symmetry becoming a thing of the past. Its smooth snow fields now jagged with black ash. Its threat of snow slides now changed to mudslides. In the deceiving soft light of sunrise, we were witnessing a transformation. The eruptions continued through the weekend. The ash continued to spread, but you had to see it from the air. The mountain stayed hidden under heavy clouds. To the dismay of thousands of faithful watchers, volcano fever had erupted in the northwest. Since the first evidence of volcanic activity, people have wanted up on the mountain, but because of possible explosive forces, the area has been sealed. People living or camping anywhere near evacuated, all spectators turned away. Say, this is as far as, you know, you're going either tonight or tomorrow or any other time. You know, yeah. We just got to keep the area clear. Sure. I understand that. Sure. Most people understood, many grumbled, but by the beginning of the week it was getting more and more clear what the danger was. This was the view photographer Lou Dieri and I shared Monday as we circled the peak with volcanologist Steve Harris. The mountain had ripped itself apart at the top, sunken in from craters. It was also covered with dark ash despite recent snows. The rim of the crater is becoming increasingly jagged. Uh, and it looks as though subsidence is still going on, judging by the extremely crevassed and cracked appearance of the snow. In fact, a considerable portion of the summit has sunk in. It was apparent the mountain was only just getting started. Sobering to think about, since the last time St. Helens erupted, it lasted 14 years. Throughout the week, the eruptions have been steady, though not horribly violent. Still, the effects have been widespread. Ash has fallen as far away as Spokane, Washington, and in the Cascades east of Salem, Oregon. Locally, the ash has created its own rain at times, blackening the snow noticeably, also creating some worries. What will it do to the wildlife, especially fish? Hatcheries throughout the area are now checking their water daily, watching to see if it becomes more acid from the fallout. Scientists are out in number two, making notes of the ash fall, keeping records of how much, how often. Right now, though, just trying to keep up with the mountain. No idea yet what it all means. But in the end, it is the mountain itself that draws us back. Because of it, evacuation plans have been drawn up. Because of it, there are threats of anything from massive hot blasts of ash and gas racing down the slopes to rapid mudslides down the valleys filling reservoirs. 
to the entire mountain splitting and spitting fire. Or maybe it will grow quiet again and outweigh us all. That perhaps is the most fascinating part. The mountain is almost beyond our capacity to know, beyond our ability to understand. In our modern world of technology, it is a force outside our control, powerful beyond our dreams, a primeval tie to nature's mystery that defies our ability to do anything more than watch and wait in childlike awe. Reporting from Mount St. Helens for Channel 2 News, I'm Bill Van Amberg. As a result of the continued eruptions on Mount St. Helens, fine ash and dust has spread over a large part of the surrounding area, particularly east of the mountain in Washington State. Here in the studio with me tonight is John Elliott Allen, geology professor emeritus from Portland State University. Professor Allen is an expert on volcanoes and the ash they produce, and he's waited a lifetime for this moment. Tell us about this ash. Where does it come from? Is this new ash? Is this old ash? Uh, uh, well, it depends on the period, right? Uh, at, as the volcano begins to erupt, it takes a long time to clear its throat, you know. Mm -hmm. And this material is mostly old ash that has formerly made up the uh, area of the throat. And so it's uh, not hot lava ash. And then as the pr pr uh, normal eruption progresses, we get uh, the development of the hot ash, which is largely glass, with containing sh small crystals of various minerals in the in the uh, magma. And uh, this is uh, this is not pumice now. This, this is, or is it? well, it, it it would be pumice if it had comes out in big lumps. I see. The ash is a fine grain. The pumice is the coarse grain sort of material. Well, now, what should people do when it when this ash falls on them and falls in the area where they are on on their cars and so forth? How well, dangerous is it? To, there's to very it? little danger. If you get into, uh, the, for the ordinary ash fall, uh, such as we're getting now, I don't see any danger except that you do have to wash out, watch out for a little bit of acid in the material. Uh, wash your car off instead of scrubbing it off or mm -hmm. brushing it off. And, uh, but uh, it will probably affect the fish if we get a heavy fall. What comes from the ash if, water, if it's dissolved in water? What well, kind of chemical there are various do we now acid. Have? There's sulfuric acid and sometimes hydrochloric acid. I in see. other words, the pH goes down from 6.8, which is normal, down to, if it goes down below 5.5, it can kill the fish. I see. And it sure yeah. could ruin your car, I yeah. suppose, if you let it sit on sit, it for if you let it sit on it or anything that you will, the girl the ladies would want to take in their wash you know yeah. but i don't worry nylon about ho a nylon stockings or silk stockings is that, is that uh, going to wreck those i don't think so i don't I think see. there'll be enough uh, the last eruption only a few inches uh, that is the last period of eruption back in the 80s uh, only a few inches fell. I see. Now, we, we heard the first time today that there were some mud flows coming down the mountain. How long are we likely to have that kind of thing continuing? Well, when the uh, mountain heats up, it, mel it melts the ice, and if we get pools of water in the crater or, or in uh, the upper part of the drainage, these can break loose and form a mud flow which may go many miles down the, the valley. How it's, fast can they travel? They can travel quite rapidly, faster than a person can run. In the, in, However, in a not, way that a, not as fast as the uh, avalanche, the uh, pyroclastic flow type of thing where it's buoyed up by the gases. This is yeah. the worst scenario that the geologists talk about. The, we hope it won't the, come we to We hope that, don't, huh? doesn't happen. But it has happened in the past. They've gone clear down into the College Valley. Mm -hmm. But we don't hope that doesn't happen. Yes. Thank you very much, Professor Allen, for being Thank with you. us. We enjoyed having you talk about the mountain. You know, the Indians used to call Mount St. Helens Smoke Mountain or Fire Mountain. And old-timer Harry Truman calls it his own mountain. Stories on both perspectives coming up after this break. For thousands of years, Mount St. Helens was known to Northwest Indians as Smoking Mountain or Fire Mountain. And through the generations, a number of legends grew up about the origin of the mountain and others in the Cascade Range. Channel 2 newsman Essex Porter has a story on this. The Indian legends of Mount St. Helens do more than explain how she was created. They also tell how the Indians who lived on this land came to be here. The Great Spirit brought two brothers here to keep them from fighting over the land they lived on. 
One was given the land south of the Great River, the other the land to the north. A bridge was built to connect the territories as a symbol of peace. Many years later, two young chiefs from each side of the river fell in love with Lou Witt, an old woman turned young and beautiful by the Great Spirit for tending the fire at the Bridge of the Gods. When the men fought over Lou Witt, the Great Spirit turned them all into mountains. One chief became Mount Hood, the other Mount Adams, and Lou Witt became the young and beautiful Mount St. Helens. She is strong-willed as well as beautiful, according to some tribes, who think of St. Helens as the henpecking wife of Mount Hood. She throws fire to get her way, and also to get attention. In 1845, Lieutenant Henry Ware sketched this scene from Coffin Rock in the mouth of the Collitz River. He wrote, My attention was attracted by Mount St. Helens, standing as it were at the end of a vista. Suddenly, a long black column of smoke and ashes shot up into the air, hanging as a canopy over the dazzling top. The ashes cover the country up to a distance of 60 miles. If some of today's news coverage sometimes makes it seem like the sky is falling, then it's easy to sympathize with the chief of the Spokane tribe interviewed in 1849 by historian Charles Wilkes. Cornelius, when about 10 years of age, was sleeping in a lodge with a great many people. He heard a great noise of thunder overhead and all the people crying out in great terror. Something was falling very thick, which they first took for snow, but it proved to be ash, which fell to a depth of six inches. The Cowlitz Indians call her Smoking Mountain. Other tribes call her Sleeping Beauty Mountain. She was named St. Helens after a British ambassador to Spain. But whatever we call her now, she binds us to our past and promises us a spectacular future. This is Essex Porter. Mount St. Helens is in good company when it comes to talking about active volcanoes. The mountain is a part of the so-called Ring of Fire that circles the Pacific Ocean. 80% of the world's active volcanoes are located around this ring. Geologists believe this situation is caused by the shifting of earth plates, actually the surface of the earth, away from the center of the Pacific Ocean toward the east and west. Volcanic activity in the Hawaiian Islands, for example, pushes these plates as lava serves as a wedge in the center of the ocean. And as they bump into the North American and Asian continents, something has got to give. Geologists believe the ground material of the continents is lighter than the ocean floor, plates, and so the plate material is pushed under the edge of the continents. At those depths and pressures, the ocean floor is reheated and turned into molten rock. It then finds its way to the surface of the earth through the path of least resistance, through a volcano. So geologists believe the material coming out of the top of Mount St. Helens is originally from the bottom of the ocean floor and was pushed under the North American continent until it was reheated to a molten form and pressure inside the earth is causing it to make its way up to the top of the mountain. That is also believed to be why the majority of earthquakes fault lines are located around the Pacific Ocean and why you won't find any active volcanoes in the middle of the continent. This theory called plate tectonics is generally accepted by geologists throughout the world as true. It makes a distinct difference between volcanoes in the Cascades and ones in the Hawaiian Islands. Material from Mount St. Helens is probably originating on the ocean floor, but the lava from the Hawaiian volcanoes comes from the core of the earth miles below the floor of the ocean. Incidentally, one volcano associated with the Ring of Fire is located right here in Portland, within the city limits. Mount Tabor in southeast Portland is the only volcano located within the city limits of a major city in the entire country. The volcano has been extinct for thousands of years now, but near the top is a plaque noting the fact that hundreds of park goers are enjoying the outdoors on the edge of a volcanic crater. Mount Tabor is described as a small vent location for some of the other larger Cascade volcanoes like Mount Hood. It was active before and during the Ice Age. 
and through the passing centuries was covered with other geological material. And so the origin of the hill was a mystery until it became a part of the city of Portland. At that time, some scientists curious about the odd shape of Mount Tabor in relation to the rest of the surrounding area took some samples and discovered the hill is made of ash or finely pulverized rock and cinders. For more than 50 years, Mount St. Helens and Harry Truman, who runs the Spirit Lake Lodge near the base of the mountain, Harry R. Truman, they've lived in each other's company. And even when all the other people in the area were moved out, Harry stayed. Reporter Robin Anderson recently talked with him about his home. Harry? Harry? It was summer last, as I recall, that I first met the mountain's keeper. It's coming. Yeah, this is my train now. And there hasn't been a picture taken 50 years of me at Spirit Lake. Uh, they, they think I'm a drinker when I'm, t I'm totally dry. But that's, that's Coke and Shinley's and ice, huh? And it was then that I first learned of Harry's love for whiskey and the mountain he calls home. He was running whiskey during Prohibition when the mountain caught his eye. He forged the northern flank for the railroad. It was 1926 that Harry put his sign in place. It's been here ever since, and I'd say it's here to stay. But it's, it's an emblem of me that them sign's been there 50-some years. What if you took it down? Well, I'm not going to take it down. Nobody's going to take it down until they take me down in a wooden kimono down that road. Ask backwards when I go down that road or I'm not leaving. And I'm not going to take my name off of that <laughs> sign that's sandblasted. I've changed it five times in my life and it's going to sit there and it rots down. And my God, I'd like to see the man that's going to take that sign off that, that post. So it came as no surprise to me that when the mountain started moving, Harry wouldn't budge. He's dueled with nature most his life. Three times his home was crushed by snow or blown to bits by gale force winds. Three times he's built it back again. And so today, as Harry keeps the home fires burning and some whiskey in his glass, there's nectar of the gods. The running battle continues. To surrender makes him laugh. <laughs> no, I'm not going to leave. You're damn right I'm not going to leave. I'm going to stay here. If I left, it'd kill me. If I left this place and lost my home, I'd die in a week. I, I couldn't live. I couldn't, I couldn't extend it. So I'm like that old captain, and by God, I'm going down the ship. I said, if the damn thing takes this mountain, I'm going along with it. I'd rather be dead for her than to live without it. <laughs> that crazy? Damn stupid. Huh? Okay. The people see that, they say the craziest man in God's real world, old Truman. At last report, Harry Truman is still staying at his home at the base of a now active volcano. For many geologists, Mount St. Helens is the first continental volcano they've been able to observe erupting. One volcano specialist explains why that is so exciting to them after this. The eruption of Mount St. Helens is providing geologists and scientists with an opportunity to see something firsthand which last occurred in the early 1900s, an active volcano in the Cascade Mountain Range. Last time any major eruptions were observed was in 1917 at Mount Lassen in Northern California. In an interview with Channel 2 reporter Essex Porter, volcanologist Stephen Harris, the author of a book on Cascade volcanoes, talked about why observing this volcano in person is so important for scientists. Harris, first tell us what we're learning from this eruption. This, uh, this eruption provides an incredible opportunity for geologists and other scientists who have been studying the uh, Cascade volcanoes. Uh, there has been a project uh, sponsored by the U.S. Geological Survey to research the deposits left by earlier eruptions, uh, particularly at Mount St. Helens. But this is the first time anyone has actually observed an eruption, and we can learn the duration, uh, the, the content, the gases emitted, of course, which are long gone by the time a geologist studies a layer. And what is particularly interesting about Mount St. Helens is that it is a volcano of incredible variety. Uh, it, it isn't like the Hawaiian volcanoes that tend to erupt it rather predictably. Uh, the Hawaiian eruption usually starts with lava fountaining at the summit and then lava flows along the flanks. St. Helens is a very explosive volcano that can erupt not only ordinary lava flows, uh, it erupts uh, pohoihoi basalt 
flows like uh, the Hawaiian volcanoes. It erupts uh, rough, clinkery, andesite lava flows we call ah uh -uh. And it also erupts dacite domes, which are extremely fragile and explosive. Uh, Goat Rocks, for example, on the north side is a lava dome that may have been erupted during historic time. Now, any of these things could occur on Mount St. Helens. So here you have uh, a living laboratory, something you can study as it's working. Uh, exactly. Uh, not only is it <clears throat> highly dramatic to view, it also provides, as you say, a living laboratory and gives us an idea of, for example, how far the winds are likely to carry ash from a moderate eruption like this. Um, a very large eruption will leave a very distinctive layer of what we call tephra, that is airborne fragmental debris. Uh, small eruptions like this probably would not have left a record. If we were not there to see them, we would not even know the eruptions had occurred. These are probably, or, or could be at any rate, the opening phase in, in a longer cycle of activity, which may lead to a major eruption such as that occurred uh, about 450 years ago, and then again about 1800, which left a heavy layer of ash north and east of the volcano. Now, other geologists have said that uh, St. Helens is in itself a bit unique in the Cascade Change with a different m geologic makeup than some of the other mountains. Discuss that a bit. That's right. Saint the, the Mount St. Helens that we see is only about uh, 2,000 years old. It buries an older volcano we call older ancestral Mount St. Helens. And the younger volcano is built mainly of what we call pyroclastic uh, debris or tephra, uh, including domes and shattered uh, rock formations. Lava flows have traditionally played a relatively minor uh, part in the uh, volcano's history. Considering the historic pattern of the volcano of Mount St. Helens, what do you expect will happen? <coughs> Personally, um, my expectations are certainly worth no more than those on any, of any person on the street. Uh, but I sort of had a feeling that St. Helens will continue this activity, it's certainly probably as long as uh, Lassen Peak did in 1914 to 1917, where you had three years of intermittent eruptions, climaxing after the first year of activity with a really major explosion that threw a cloud seven miles into the stratosphere, uh, erupted a flow of lava, caused a very large and destructive mud flow, and a horizontal hot blast that destroyed about five million cubic feet of timber. St. Helens could easily do something like that. Dr. Harris's book is called Fire and Ice, the Cascade Volcanoes. And in that book, he predicted that Mount St. Helens would be the first of the Cascade Mountains to have a volcanic eruption, and he predicted it would happen before the end of this century. Will Mount St. Helens continue to spew ash, begin a full-scale eruption, or die out soon? The best answers possible to those questions coming up after this. Remarkable as it may seem, geologists are still not much closer to accurately predicting the behavior of the Mount St. Helens volcano, even though they've been watching its every move since the eruptions began last week. Every day seems to bring a new change in the mountain. The appearance of the harmonic tremors indicates there is hot lava inside the mountain, but no one can say for certain when or if it will make its way to the surface. Even with all our scientific knowledge, Mount St. Helens is still the unpredictable personality described by the Indians. All we can do is watch in awe. And we have been watching for a week now, round the clock. As a matter of fact, our crews have put in horrendous amounts of overtime. We've had helicopters on call through all the daylight hours. And of course, we want to pay credit to them for what you've seen here tonight, and especially to our cameramen who have brought you these spectacular views of that awesome mountain. And that's our special report on Mount St. Helens Volcano. Remember, stay tuned to Channel 2 News at 5, 6.30, and 11 for the very latest information on the volcano and all of the news of the Northwest. Good night.